I've worked with lots of search firms, both as a leader searching for new talent for my teams and as an individual exploring new steps in my career, but I trust none more than Wirt and Company. Since 1995, Wirt and Company has been the design community's most trusted search firm, co-founded by a designer and led by a CEO who has in-house operational startup experience. Wirt and Company is guided by the principle that creative leadership is essential to business success. They've helped some of the most admired brands from early stage startup to Fortune 500 build world-class creative teams. We're talking about companies like Airbnb, The New York Times, The Four Seasons, Notion, Figma, Google, Cartier, and Fair. Not bad. If you're looking for a partner to help you find the right person for a critical role, look no further than Wirt and Company. And if you're looking for your next design leadership role, Wirt and Company will guide you through the process as a friend and a champion throughout your journey. They take the time to get to know you, to understand what you need professionally and personally. Whether you're looking for your next role or your next team member, Wirt and Company can help you find a meaningful relationship. Visit wirtco.com to learn more and get in touch. That's W E R T C O.com. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings. And I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. Hey everybody, we hope you're having a festive holiday season and that you're able to take some time off to be with friends and family. Today we're rewinding to our interview with Robin Petrovich, co-owner of Heath Ceramics. We love Heath Ceramics. They're the types of objects you pass on from generation to generation, the kind of gift you bring to a wedding or the dishes that you'd want to put on a beautiful holiday table. Speaking of which, if you have a little holiday money to spend, you can support our show, bring Heath home, and take 15% off between now and December 31st. Just go to dbtr.co slash heathceramics and use code dbholiday23. That's dbtr.co slash heathceramics and use code dbholiday23. Thanks for listening. If you're a fan of architecture and design, you're probably familiar with the mid-century modern movement. It brought a simple, clean aesthetic inspired by the Bauhaus and international movements to the U.S. Heath Ceramics, founded by Edith Heath in 1948 and influenced by mid-century modern principles, is still making beautiful handcrafted tableware and architectural tile in Sausalito, California. We wanted to chat with Heath's current owner, Robin Petrovich, to find out how they approach designing within the legacy of the Heath brand, as well as the story of how he and his partner and co-owner, Catherine Bailey, came to be owners of the company. We also talked with Robin about how the pandemic affected their business and some of the collaborative challenges and opportunities they faced in transitioning to a hybrid remote scenario. We hope you're inspired as we were to hear Heath's story. Thanks as always for listening. Robin Petrovich, welcome to the Design Better podcast. Thanks for having me on. We're really excited to have you. And Robin, you and I have a little bit of a history. We went through the same design program at Stanford. You were in the grad program. I was an undergrad. You were actually my TA back in the day in a fun class called ME 103 that was all about making things. So we wanted to kind of start off with a little more history and maybe you could start off just talking about how you came about to be the owners of Heath Ceramics, you and your wife, what led up to that? Yeah, so I'm co-owner of Heath Ceramics along with my wife, Kathy Bailey. She was an industrial designer. We met through working together. I came out of the product design program at Stanford and and found myself doing a little bit more mechanical engineering type of product design. And she was an industrial designer. We ended up doing some independent projects together. 
And we were doing that for a few years. Then we found ourselves really starting to look for something else that had been missing for us. You mentioned our co-experience at Stanford, you know, all about making things. You know, we were finding that when we were in the modern world in 90s, <laughs> late 90s, that modern world of design and product design. As a designer, it wasn't much about making things anymore. As you know, Eli, that's what we loved when we were at that program of just like it would, you know, hours would disappear because we were making things in the shop and time would just melt away. So the making things was not so prevalent. It was really, you know, the design process with manufacturing going overseas had this big disconnect that we were experiencing and, and we were still feeling idealistic and at that point and hoping for something that would bring us back to why we found ourselves interested in design in the first place. So totally by serendipity, we happened to be in Sausalito. Uh, we had moved to Sausalito, rather. We, had, we happened to move to Sausalito and and we're exploring our new town and came across this very interesting mid-century style building that wasn't in the best of shape, but it was pretty unique down on Gate 5 Road and old Marin ship area where the Liberty ships used to be made. Walked in the door, the little store there, and were kind of blown away by what we found and then peeked in the windows around the corner and saw all this old machinery and dusty carts with pottery on it that looked like they could be abandoned. <laughs> couldn't tell if it was, you know, it was probably Saturday, so we couldn't tell if somebody had been working on things on Friday or Friday two years ago. The business was, you know, it was on a downward trend at that point. That is how we came across it. You know, I hadn't been familiar with it at all. Kathy was a little bit familiar with the name. She'd been collecting Eva's Isol pottery for a little while. That's actually what we ate on at home. But we were really intrigued by this business that we thought needed some help. It didn't seem to be doing well and was a business that actually made its own products right there in, in our new hometown. And so I literally picked up the phone one day and called a number I'd been given and said, you know, are you interested in selling your business? Because we're interested in buying the business. We talked for a while and, and made it happen. Probably took about six months between the first phone call to my first day in the office, August 16th, 2003. That's amazing. And just to give listeners a little context here. So you and Kathy were doing work for like Nike and Motorola, these marquee brands of the modern world, who, you know, in many ways, especially at the time, were doing a lot of innovative things. And you accidentally stumbled upon Heath Ceramics, which... If listeners aren't familiar with Heath Ceramics, this is a brand with an incredible history and legacy and has been tremendously influential on design today for many years. You just happen to find this amazing brand of the past and just by raising your hand, created this opportunity to resurrect it. So could you talk to us a little bit about the history of Heath Ceramics and Edith Heath, who started the business back in, I believe, the late 40s or early 50s. Is that right? It's the late 40s. Late 40s. Yeah. So she started at, you know, a fascinating lady, both in her kind of where she came from, an Iowa farm, was determined to actually finish high school, which was a little bit uncommon for girls living on the farm back in those days, and ended up going through a teacher's college and then art school being connected with the Works Progress Administration, teaching art, you know, the programs that were put together at that time were sort of between the wars. Then she came out to California, had an interest in ceramics. She was a painter beforehand, that was her medium, and turned it into her interest in ceramics and teaching ceramics into a business that later on she was joined by her, her husband, Brian Heath, who was a social worker. And they both had a very sort of social work bent which is still, I think, very integral in, in, in the DNA of Heath today. It started out in the backroom studio and then grew into more of a factory scale operation. Always human scale. Uh, that was always very important. But that's where it came from. You know, it was a time in California and in America where people were able to experiment and try new things and exploration and materials and color. You know, Edith Heath, she had a moment there where she said, I don't know why white clay is the standard for everything. You know, white porcelain clays. I'm going to do something different. And that's when she started experimenting with brown clays and different clay bodies and where a lot of the signature look and feel of what we still make today comes from. 
So that's the brief intro. There's so much in that story. There's a, a wonderful new book called uh, Edith Heath Philosophies that just came out a few months ago that has a lot of the sort of historic details of pre Heath ceramics, Edith's history, what inspired her, where she came from, as well as Heath ceramics after that. She and Brian started the company and put many decades into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And anyone who's a fan of mid century modern design should know about Edith Heath because timing was everything. Starting this business in the late 40s, that's post-World War II, people are thinking about how do we design a new way of living, a new way of living closer to nature and or industrializing, just basically re-examining a lot of the philosophies of how we, we make a life. Yeah, I mean, definitely the California outdoor lifestyle had a big influence on her from a design point of view, the way that she and Brian lived and the designs were meant to reflect that, that sort of different, simple lifestyle. She actually made a, I just learned this recently, she actually made a, a line of dinnerware for camping. Wow, that's <laughs> fascinating. It didn't really work out, but it was pushing really hard on that idea of living outdoors. So there's kind of an amazing thing of working inside of this history and legacy of Edith Heath and mid-century modern thinking. And that can create an incredible vocabulary for new ideas and new experimentation. It could also introduce some limitations. Could you tell us a little bit about how you think about working within a design legacy? First of all, I think we consider it to be very fortunate that there is a design legacy. We have a company that makes products that many of which are, you know, it's like a living museum. You know, we have this archive where we can go back many, many decades of not just product, but also experiments and experimentation or ideas. And we can pull from that as inspiration. And so it's a way that I think, you know, at least for Kathy and myself, feels very natural for us to evolve things. For example, we're not the type of people that would buy an old house and tear it down and build something new. You buy an old house and think about how can we bring it back, right? And so it's very much how we think about Keith as well. It's just kind of a good fit in that way. The things that we do today are all an evolution of what was started in the past. It's one long line. And sometimes it goes in a circular fashion. And sometimes it just kind of continues into sort of new trajectories. But there's always a lot of building on that past, both in product and, and other aspects of the business as, as well. Interestingly enough, we just decided we actually did have a white clay body and a brown clay body for many years. And the white clay body came out, I, I think, in the 70s as Heath was doing more and more restaurant dinnerware. And, and that was one of the reasons why. And we just decided last fall to discontinue that and really go back to the roots of just the brown clay body. So we could really more fully explore the core of where Heath came from and the experimentation of those clays that came from Edith driving around California to different clay pits. I don't think of the legacy as a constraint. We could probably dig in really deep and I could find things that are limitations for sure. But really, I think we see them more as inspiration and opportunity. And it is a different way to sort of design, right? And it's like, you know, there's a lot of design that's just about like, you know, create something new, innovate, create things that haven't been seen before. And we instead are evolving and we've got this long legacy of product that we are trying to, you know, if you look at our catalog, this is a kind of an interesting thing, but the last time we did a new website, you know, we would talk with all these web designers and about the right platform and this and that. And it would always show us this work that they did for companies that only had three products. <laughs> and we just like, you know, I sort of sit there and scratch my head and be like, okay, is this gonna work? Cause we've got, maybe this is the legacy where the legacy comes in and it might be a limitation in this sense, but you know, we had over 300 products. We gotta make it all make sense on this platform. And what we're seeing here is works great for three, but I don't know if it's gonna work for this sort of intricate interweaving of this line. Anyway, I love it. I love the history. It's inspirational. I love everything from the building to old pieces of Heathware to employees that have been around for over 50 years. Yeah, I love it all. It's inspiring. Robin, you and I shared a professor, Matt Kahn, who was sort of famous in our program for instilling some of these sort of mid-century modern aesthetic in, in his students. I certainly came to love it through his work. But I'm also wondering, you know, in addition to that, were there any other inspirations that uh, Aaron and I were discussing this idea of wabi-sabi, this Japanese idea of imperfection and sort of the handmade quality of a lot of your products. So you bring in inspiration from, from other areas as well. 
quick story about Matt Kahn. You know, he, he worked on interior designs for early Eichler films and you know, was a professor at Stanford for years and years. And he was famous amongst his students for, well, for many things. But I think one of the big things was when you would go over to his house, he would have into his painting studio, his paintings were all these very fine lines he did with a paintbrush and sometimes with string, you know, nails and string, you know, sort of very refined, particular string art, you know, one might say. So the first time I walked into Brian Heath's office, one of his paintings was sitting over <laughs> the desk. And it turned out that they were actually friends. They were good friends for a while, the Heaths and the Collins. That was a very nice connection. Later on, I actually bought that painting and it hangs in my house today. So I own a Matt Kahn, which makes me very happy. Matt Kahn, that was originally owned by Edith and Brian Heath. Other influences are the influences that are the influences of Edith Heath, rather than bringing in anything from the side. If we are to look at influences, you know, there's certainly, you know, the modern aesthetic and the modern lifestyle. There's California, just the whole idea of doing something new. I think the revolutionary things that Edith Heath did, for example, was a coffee cup that didn't have a saucer. You know, you kind of think about that, and all of a sudden there's a there's a new informality that is shifting the culture. And those are the kind of things that came out of California, this place where we could experiment and we could try things. And maybe this is what brings me back to what you were you were asking, Aaron, of the limitations of legacy. You know, I think in design of certainly in ceramics, there were legacy limitations coming from traditions, white porcelain clays, fine chinas, and that got stored in glass cabinets and only came out on white tablecloths. And Edith Heath was able to move those aside with brown earthy clay bodies, but with a modern design and creating coffee cups that didn't require a saucer, but you could carry them outside and hold them in a different way. And actually, interestingly enough, there were social inspirations as opposed to design inspirations in some way. Again, she and Brian had very strong ideas about more democratic societies and how to bring more people into the fold and make products that could have that appeal in the sort of new society coming after the Second World War and, and again in California too. So there's that influence, a social influence in the design. And then also, a, a, you know, a Bauhaus influence around the materials and function because Heath is very much still, uh, you know, the core of sign and the feel of it is, is around the quality of the materials, the acceptance of imperfection and embracing of imperfection and the techniques that are used in glazing that we look to enhance imperfection or to surprise us. That even in the production process, we hope that they will sometimes give us a surprise that we won't always know the exact result where we're trying to match something that happened before and, and create things that are identical. This is the part that I find particularly fascinating about the Heath perspective is this philosophy and aesthetic emerging out of modernism and this industrial era. One of the qualities of modernism is almost to scrub the humanity out of the space, the object, to make everything very simple and clean. Think about Philip Stark, uh, you know, like trying to live in a Philip Stark house. It's amazing and it's beautiful, but it doesn't really feel like one could kind of let their life unpack there. Mm -hmm. In my house, I have a fireplace in my bedroom that has Heath tile on it. It's three-dimensional ellipses that are white. Yeah, They're beautiful. And when they were being installed, he was just perplexed. It's like, there's no straight lines on this thing. It's all like <laughs> wobbly and stuff. And so there's this contradiction of participating in a modern aesthetic and yet defying one of the core principles of like, it could be manufactured, it could be built systematically, we could take that humanity out of it. And one of the reasons why my wife and I chose these tiles is because they're handmade. My wife's a potter too, and so she has an affinity for that feeling of handmade. Why is it so important to have that presence of hand, especially coming out of this modern philosophy? Well, I mean, I think that that term handmade is an interesting one to debate as well, because, you know, technically, Heath, dinnerware Heath Tell is not handmade. A lot of the processes are made by machine. You know, we're not fully automated. And, and they could even be certain processes could be more automated. There could be robots involved in certain aspects of what we do and how we do it. But we do always leave room for the touch of the hand. And that, again, is a core principle. It's like 
modern design made by machine, but with the touch of the hand. And the touch of the hand is perhaps another term that relates to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, which was leaving room for imperfection, leaving room for surprise, leaving room for experimentation in almost every piece that comes out. So why is that important? I mean, for Heath and for me, it's important on a couple of different levels. For one, I I just think it's beautiful (laughs) that every piece is a little bit, can be a little bit different. Interestingly, Kathy and I and the Heaths have one thing in common, which is that pretty much all of the Heathware that we have in our house are seconds, they're rejects, (laughs) because there's beauty in those pieces that we see. But it's also the idea that Heath is always a company that is made up of people. And we don't forget that. And again, having the manufacturing right here and locally reminds us of that. And that's always a core principle too, that the people that make the product are just as important as the product itself. And when products come out of containers, (laughs) you don't get a sense of that and you don't get to celebrate that. There's that disconnect there. The Heaths and part of the DNA of Heath Ceramics is a combination of the social and the design element that do come together both in the design, how the pieces are made, how the company is run, what our values are, and and how we set our priorities. That's been there from the beginning. It's even, I think, stronger today for us just coming out of the pandemic than it was beforehand. I think we realized, you know, what it really meant. But it's interesting because it does come back to, you know, some of the founding principles that Ethan and Brian had around products made by people and what that relationship means. Support for Design Better comes from Uplift Desk, who help you work better and live healthier. Eli and I log a lot of hours at our desks, which can be detrimental to one's health if you're not paying attention to ergonomics. Uplift Desk offer high-quality, well-designed desks, chairs, and accessories to help you build an ergonomic workspace for home or work. Eli recently got a standing desk, and I got a human-scale freedom chair. I've been dreaming about this chair for a long time, and I finally got one. I've already noticed a big change in my posture with this chair, and my body thanks me for it. Eli is logging a lot more hours standing than sitting these days, and he can make quick transitions with the flip of a switch. We love Uplift Desk, and we know that you will too. Design Better listeners can get a special deal by visiting upliftdesk.com and use the code DESIGNBETTER at checkout for 5% off your order. You'll get free shipping, free returns, and an industry-leading 15-year warranty. Go to upliftdesk.com, use code DESIGNBETTER, and get 5% off. Design a better workspace with Uplift Desk. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings, and I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. Support for Design Better comes from Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery. Design Better listeners can save 50% on their order at factormeals.com slash designbetter50. Use the code designbetter50. You know what happens at my house when things get really busy? In the evenings, we turn to takeout, which can be expensive and it's not very good for our health. Lately, we're making a better choice at crunch time. We turn to Factor for chef-created, dietitian approved meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. We like the flexibility of Factor, too. You can change your order up every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or you can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. The meals are so tasty. My wife and I are huge fans. And I like their smoothies too, which I find are perfect for a quick, healthy breakfast. Factor can help you eat well and feel good while focusing on your career and your family. Head to factormeals.com slash designbetter50 
and use the code DESIGNBETTER50 to get 50% off your order. That's code DESIGNBETTER50 at factormeals.com slash designbetter50 to get half off your order. Just hearkening back for a minute to the origins of Heath and social work, you had an interesting poster. So we have an alumni thread where various conversations happen, sometimes trivial and centered around coffee, but sometimes more interesting. <laughs> sometimes it's about, about uh, you know, screws. Screws, I, yeah. yeah I fast, love those. Fasteners, that kind of fasteners. thing. Fasteners. Yeah, can go on Geek forever. Out. Yep. <laughs> but I thought you had a really interesting post where you spoke to Heath's commitment to providing a living wage, and you, you actually use, I think, MIT's index for that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And also, there's certainly a direct cost to that, but perhaps there's also some advantage right now where people are having a hard time hiring in the current environment. So maybe you could speak to that too. One of the things that early on with the Heaths was a focus was this modernist philosophy of trying to make things for the most people. They were not trying to make things just like the Eameses weren't. They were not trying to make things that were for a small subset of people that could afford them. You know, they were really trying to make things that were also available to the middle class. And it's a wonderful sort of direction. I think today it's just really hard, especially making things in the Bay Area. I often think about like, what does Heath produce, right? And, and there's certainly always going to be a critique of like, well, Heath makes really expensive pottery. And, you know, we kind of get that when people that are not introduced to the brand or the backstory, they might pick up a mug in the ferry building and, and see $40 on the back of it and think, wow, this, why is this stuff so expensive? I can go to Ikea or Target and get something for much, much less, right? So, you know, what does Heath actually do? And it does go back to the, the beginnings again, like, what is our business? You know, so you know, while part of our business is making a really beautiful product, we are just as much a business that is here to create good manufacturing jobs. That's also just part of our mission as much as creating beautiful product. That's essential to who we are. And so it is all about how to make all those things work, how to make product that is still beautiful here in the Bay Area and create good manufacturing jobs and try not to compromise on either. And that's kind of where decisions around price and, and, and the way we run things get made. Creating good manufacturing jobs here in the Bay Area where we live you know, to sort of create a balance in our local community, our local society, which, you know, in the Bay Area is especially hard. And that's just kind of our chosen focus. We always thought that we paid pretty well. We paid certainly within our means. It's always hard to run a business making pottery in, in a place where software <laughs> profits can be double digit. And we're sort of down to many double digits and we're lucky to get over 5%. We try to do really well, but we also try to sort of really kind of keep that philosophy around product price intact too. And I think we've kind of thrown that out a little bit and, and just said, like, you know, we really need to commit to this living wage and we need to charge what we need to charge. And that's what we've done. We we're paying well above minimum wage, you know, two years ago, last fall, we committed to living wage and tying ourselves to that MIT index, which was a big step up, you know, for that initial run, initial jump and we went from $16 an hour being our lowest paid job to $20 an hour being our lowest paid job. This year that's moved up to $21. We're not actually technically at living wage today, but we're still tied to that index. And the reason why is because the update in 2021, the living wage jumped by 35%. <laughs> so we said, okay, we still need to commit to this, but we're giving ourselves three years to catch up to it over time. So we're still tied to it. It's still a guiding principle for us. And I think it's really important that that's the focus of the business and kind of how do we contribute to our local society and include more people simply by giving them the means to get beyond just getting by. Robin, I want to rewind back to your origin story because what you're sharing is a pretty clear philosophy in terms of like how this business should be run You've articulated clearly how it relates to the legacy of how the Heaths have always run this. And there's also the aesthetics of the design philosophy of the business. You and Kathy sort of discovered Heath with a little bit of information, but presumably when you purchased this company, like that's a pretty huge learning curve to get up to speed. What was it like for the two of you to buy a business, learn everything about the history of the business? and keep that legacy going and then expand it further. How did you do that? Well, there's still a lot to learn. 
but it was a huge learning curve from the beginning in terms of sort of the discovery. And a lot of the discovery came from just sitting in, kind of following in those footsteps of Edith and Brian Heath. When I do go to the office, my desk is Brian Heath's old desk. His pencil sharpener and letter opener are still in there. I still use them. I still use his calculator that has a cigarette burn on it because he used to prop his cigarettes up on the little solar panel that would flip up. I love that thing. And I love the cigarette burn. (laughs) So just sort of being in the factory and following their footsteps, you kind of learn. And it was a whole period of just kind of unpacking, literally unpacking boxes, literally opening cabinets, and then doing so also metaphorically in understanding how things were a certain way, why things were a certain way. And I think it comes back to the way that, you know, Kathy and I think about what is a business? What's the purpose of a business? We never went into this thing as anybody could have of like, you know, we're going into business to make as much money as possible, which is sometimes the case in small businesses where small business owners at the end of the year, they just pay themselves out a lot and that's the goal. And we're not here to build a business and then to sell it for as much as we can. It wasn't financially driven. It was about where could we take and evolve this legacy, knowing that it had to actually work financially. So it has always been about creating that sort of a balance between like a business that works, but we don't think of it as a business. For us, it's just kind of a long-term project where we put a couple of stakes in the ground around certain things that are really important to what we found beautiful about it and what we think is important to continue to exist as an example of how one can make things work in our society. And those are things like we're always going to manufacture locally. And, you know, where I was going to manufacture in our community. And I remember having a, you know, a very specific point in talking to somebody that was advising me on like how to buy the business or raise money or how I was going to need capital and how I was going to make it work. And, and the suggestion came up of like, maybe you need to move. Actually, the person I think said, you're going to have to move some of your production overseas. You're not going to make it all here. And I, I remember leaving that conversation and putting a stake in the ground of like, no, the goal is going to be how to keep it here and figure out that puzzle. We would start off with those kind of stakes in the ground that would then help us discover like, well, what is important about making it here? What do you get out of making it locally and sort of living in your factory, working out of your factory as designers, as the leader of the business that you don't get when you're really sending orders to a factory someplace and getting that product shipped by container sometime. And so that's what the really interesting journey is. It also makes it a lot more complicated. <laughs> it's, we have a very complicated business and we don't do ourselves any favors. But again, you know, the goal is not perfect efficiency. The goal is the end result. So we've learned a lot of things like that on the way of like why those things are important. Why, again, is it important that the touch of the hand, as you mentioned, is integral even when things are run by machinery? How does this sort of the creative spirit stay alive? is part of it all too. And and again, I don't think it would exist if the factory were somewhere else. So during the pandemic, Robin, you decided to move a lot of your non-manufacturing staff online to remote positions. And we actually had a conversation a few months back about that. Is there anything you've learned over the course of that? Anything between like the collaboration for those who are working remote, those who are working person, challenges that you've overcome or are still facing? Anything along those lines? Well, I'm really proud of kind of how we navigated through it all because we actually found ways to communicate better and work better together as a whole company. It's incredibly hard to have a company that does everything because it's a very, you know, from manufacturing, factories, retail showrooms, designers, finance people, marketing people, different levels of education, background, different cultural background, different languages, different financial backgrounds and so on and so forth, it's hard to kind of connect all those things. I mean, just the use of video calls has been huge in kind of bringing everybody in the same room, so to speak. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. Being a location-based business, we're finally kind of able to do that and share things together. The other thing it forced us to do was over-communicate. And we've gotten really good at over-communicating. We've gotten really good at change management because of the ability to sort of always be on a video call and to bring everybody into it all the time. You know, we used to have these weird situations where, you know, we'd say like, okay, let's have a meeting. And somebody's like, well, I'm going to be in San Francisco today. I won't, but I'm going to be in Sausalito today. And 
So, you know, finding a day to all be in the same location because that was extremely important. And it was funny, we would have these days when, because we have the factory in San Francisco that makes tile, the old factory in Sausalito that makes dinnerware, and people would move like flocks of birds to San Francisco one day, and then they'd all move to Sausalito the next day together. And it was just kind of a very inefficient thing. And, you know, the pandemic kind of just solved that problem for us after we've been frustrated by it for years and not knowing what to do with it. So tons of silver linings there. There are challenges, though, and I'm definitely, you know, sort of feeling challenges around the remoteness. I mean, we've brought everybody back to the office and we laid out a um, hybrid work plan. We started pretty early. We reopened the office in, in June and we brought everybody along again. It was like a big change management process of like, hey, here's what we're thinking. What are your thoughts? And we tried things out and say, okay, we're going to give this a shot for a while. So June, we opened up offices and we offered people the option of, you know, do you want to be a remote person? First of all, like, is your job a remote job? Is it an on-site job? Is it a hybrid job, you know, where you can come in a few days a week? And then what do you want to be? You want to be remote? Do you want to come in every day? We'll give you a desk. And kind of letting people have that choice and kind of thinking through it. The fairness is always a challenge in having a feel fair because some people in our business have to be on site every day. There's no choice there because we have factories, we have retail showrooms. But the, the things that are missing, I think, are a little bit in the, you know, sort of what I feel is important to the DNA and early inspiration is, again, that being at the factory, like having that factory there in terms of inspiring the process and, again, how we think about our people. And so I'm starting to see a little bit of that missing, I think, you know, some of the, you know, some of the work that we do where being in the environment of the factory of that original building is missing. And especially so as we do bring new people on board, as we bring new people on board and certain admin roles who are not getting that as part of their early introduction to Heath. For Heath anyway, that's a pretty essential intro to the culture of the business, to the legacy of the business, but also kind of the daily inspiration that makes Heath unique because we have those historic factories and those historic archives and, and frankly, some historic people <laughs> that have been here for a really long time. So we're missing a little bit of that, that we're trying to figure out how to sort of get that back, but still have some of the great things that we found work really well with the ability to work remotely. At this point, Heath and the products that you offer has expanded way beyond where it started with pottery and ceramics. There's glassware, there's flatware, there's textiles, there's bags. Could you talk to us about the design process of how you approach a new product? And how does that fit into your, your manufacturing strategy? There's a mix of different products. We're pretty early on when we first started opening showrooms, maybe in about, you know, LA opened in 2008 and the Ferry Building, I think 2010 and then San Francisco in 2012, we had brought in other product from other vendors and, you know, vendors that we had an affinity for in terms of the product, the craftsmanship, the way they went about their business. And that went anywhere around the table from linens to glassware, ultimately furniture and things like that. So we still do a lot with vendors. And then there are a few things that we started designing on our own. Flatware is a great story. We would always wanted to, first of all, we always found it really hard to find flatware that really connected with Heath in terms of not only the design, but again, the way it was made and the craftsmanship. The only line we found that really fit that bill was an English company called David Miller. Again, small shop. But eventually we found, I don't know who found or how we came across it, but we found a manufacturer in upstate New York called Cheryl Manufacturing. And it was a couple of guys, it was sort of similar to a Heath story, but it was a couple of guys that used to work at Oneida, big maker of flatware and ceramics as well. Originally started out of a commune. Interestingly enough, it was the way that they funded their commune. They had bought equipment and they kept an old building and they were making old Oneida designs in upstate New York. We connected with them and you know we loved the story. We loved that it was made in the US and and we wanted to do a new pattern with them. And so we did a new pattern called the Muir pattern. And it's been amazing. So a lot of that process, again, is like factory visits are essential. Understanding the process, connecting with the people who are not only making the tools, but running the machinery and working within those constraints, you know. So we definitely 
doing what we do, we, we know that there are constraints around the manufacturing and how do we celebrate that as opposed to be blind to it. So we've done that with two more lines with them that have been in the works for a long time, but they're too busy to get to them, but we're excited to still do it. And that's been a really nice success story in terms of those designs there. Robin, you mentioned earlier that you're feel like your values are stronger after going through the pandemic. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, I think it really comes down to, we have three pillars in our mission, you know, people, product, and planet. The balance between those three has become a little bit more even, I think, in the pandemic. I mean, definitely the people aspect, right? You know, we talked about the living wage initiative that we went through, and the pandemic really did bring that to light. It came back to the fact that, okay, we could all go work at home. And, and then some of these you know, guys in those early days and everybody's freaked out, they had to go to the factory every day. And then somebody would come down with COVID and they were all there and everybody else is working at home. And so you start to realize kind of uh, not necessarily the disparities, but also just kind of the contributions, I guess, that different people make and, and how sometimes they don't really line up with pay and privilege of other kinds. So it's an old story and it just kind of comes to light a little bit more. And it's also what I love about Heath, right? We can't be blind to that. So those kind of things are just like who had to come back to work first, who's had to be at work during the whole time of the pandemic, really kind of strengthened that spotlight on how we really need to proactively think about that balance. And I think one of the challenges in society is typically that people who have more privilege and more education and stronger finances tend to be the loudest, but sometimes not seeing the bigger picture. And that got out of balance for Heath too. It is the way that I think society works and you just always got to watch it and reel it in. And in the pandemic, we were able to get everybody attuned to it, which wasn't easy for me to do before. And now we are much more cognizant of who we're all making decisions for, to put that succinctly. From the environmental planet standpoint too, we're realizing that that's another pillar that's also extremely important that we have to put a lot of work behind because it's been a tough couple of years of, you know, Heath is a funny place. You know, we've always had flooding in our Sausalito factory. So, you know, we talk about like, okay, it's flood season now. And then it's like, you know, and the employees are coming to me like, okay, flood season, we're used to that. Flood's easy. Okay, pandemic season, we're like, okay, now we're dealing with pandemic and keeping everybody safe from the virus. And, you know, and lately people have been coming up to me and saying like, so you worried about fire season now? It's like, yeah, we're ready to move on to fire season <laughs> and smoke and all those things. And so we're just kind of like, we're constantly up against these forces that we're not in control of, but that we have to handle and do something about. And, you know, we live in a capitalist society. And so far, all I've been able to figure out is that's, you know, living within that in order to still sustain these three pillars, but to do so in a regenerative way where we're making money so we can give back. And then we're not part of an extractive economy where we're not only mining resources, but we're mining people, right? Like some economies, some businesses are extracting resources from human beings as much as they are from the planet. And we've never wanted to be part of that. But again, we're, we're much more cognizant now that that really has to be our focus. It's important. It's also just what inspires us that we're able to build something that is always bringing things back into the people at the company that are able to do things in a more responsible way for the future of our, our planet as well and make great product <laughs> doing so, respecting craftsmanship. Where can people learn more about you and about Heath? The primary place to sort of learn about Heath Ceramics is our website, heathceramics.com. But otherwise, what we would really like people to do in moderation is come visit us in person. So, you know, we have our original dinnerware factory and showroom is in Sausalito. And we used to do public tours on weekends. I hope we can get back to those soon. That would be fantastic. And then our main small store in the Ferry Building in San Francisco. And then another big location in San Francisco on 18th Street in Florida, where we have our tile factory, big glass walls on the showroom. And we love for people to visit us there as well. And hopefully we can do tours of the Tile Factory again at some point. And then we're also in L.A. We've had a showroom in L.A. since 2010. And part of that L.A. showroom is a clay studio in the back of that. So all of our stores have many dimensions. It's not just the store. They're always tied to a factory or studio. And so it's much more of an experience. 
Robin, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>